Okay, yeah, well, thank you all for coming. Um, yeah, this is my first time ever giving a lecture like this. So please let me know if, you know, how it goes and areas of improvement and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I was uh, approached by Luca and Raul um, a week and a half ago now. And they were like, oh yeah, there's this uh, academia session slot open on the 22nd. Do you want to do it? I'm like, sure. And Thank I agreeing. Thank you for agreeing in such short notice. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and I, I thought about like what could I present? And I'm like, what I sort of wanted as a graduate student um is a workshop or a lecture on how to write a scientific paper because this is a thing that so in science it's in 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 our training we taught a lot of things. Uh, experimental design, blocking, statistics, what a control is, you name it. But oftentimes I find that we're not explicitly taught how to write a scientific paper. It's something that we are expected to pick up by osmosis and just through trial and error um, through like revisions and edits with RPIs, with, you know, committees and and the like. And oftentimes I find that it's a uh, it's it's training by telling you what not to do. So for example, um you'll get a revisions back on a manuscript from your PI and it marks with track changes and they're like, oh you should change this, you should change that. And it's more about like training in how your PI style is. So I found you know training with uh, Rich, I adopted a lot of his style. And I was never sat down and was given like a formal training, like this is what an abstract does, this is what an introdu introduction does, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's what I've hoped I am going to do today, but I'm by no means an expert. I mean, I'm still a trainee myself and uh, only I've only written three papers, three first author papers. So I still have a lot to learn too. So I hope this is sort of like a, this, this hour, however long it takes, will be a conversation. And so we can, I can, I can, uh, I can uh, talk, uh, give you some bullet points and whatnot, but I would love um, to hear your feedback and hear what works for you, what work that doesn't work for you, et cetera. So that's sort of how I envision this talk. So to start off, I, I found this nice quote, and I think it really encapsulates the value of writing. It says, nothing in science has any value to, so to society if it is not communicated. And I would also add if it's not communicated and understood by your intended audience. So what is scientific, scientific writing? It's writing that's designed to communicate scientific information to others. And there are several different types of scientific writing. There are original research articles, so that's what I'm primarily going to focus on here in this talk. But there are review articles that summarize and integrate a body of research. There are grant fellowship proposals and there are scientific posters. And the purpose, the audience, and the organization of these different um, types of scientific writing might change, but there are similarities. And, this, really, the, the two I want to get across are clarity and persuasiveness. Um, these things are important, but I think they come second to value. So I describe value as audience-centric. So your audience, your reader, is who matters. I've heard it said in the past that you as the author, they, you don't matter as much. It's what your reader takes away from your work. So the value of your work depends on the audience. And I've 
uh, I, I posted it into the academia Slack channel this uh, this talk by um, his name is Larry McEnany, and he had this talk called The Craft of Writing Effectively. And he stated in this talk that scientific writing is not meant to convey your ideas, but instead to change your audience's ideas. And I think this is a rather provocative statement, but it's really true. Um, your, your audience is the individuals who will find the value in your work and they'll take the meaning from it. And you want to change their ideas and that's the that's the key takeaway from that. So a piece of writing is important not because it is creating new knowledge or it is original, but because it is valuable to some readers. And the audience gets to decide what counts as new knowledge. So uh, this Dr. McEnany, uh, he had this nice analogy. Um, that the value isn't is that important because it's creating new knowledge. So anyone can come and generate new knowledge. It's a very it's a it's a rather trivial thing to do on like in its most basic form. So for example, the number of people who are in this talk right now, nobody else on earth knows how many people are in this talk exactly. We can publish that. We can say, oh, there's, you know, how many people are here? I don't know. Let's say 10 people are here. We can publish that. It's new knowledge, but nobody's going to care. Um, so the value is decided by your readers. It's not decided by the author. Um, so to, to, we have to keep that in mind. And we, uh, we can convey value through a certain set of code words that are specific to our fields. And these code words, they, they communicate that value. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the code words uh, in a couple of slides. Kyle, can you go back one slide really quick? Mm -hmm. yeah. I wanna, oh, sorry, back one more. I wanted to add um, one thing to this is that I think that to this second bullet point, we also should think about adding blog posts, mm -hmm. tweets, you know, more and more our job as scientists. Like I, I loved your very first thing, which is that, you know, the, the value of scientific writing is or our jobs as scientists is to communicate and be understood. Um, it was actually at the TED Med conference in 2012 that Jonathan Eisen got me backstage. I don't know if you guys follow the Eisen brothers on Twitter, but he really challenged me, asked if I had a Twitter presence. And I said, no, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, what is your job? And I said, my job is to do science. He said, no, your job is not to do science. Your job is to communicate science, to do and communicate. And if you're, if you're not sort of, and, and most people would say, if you're writing papers, that's you're doing your job. And his argument was, that's only a very small part of the job these days, because the number of people who will read your papers is smaller than the number of people who are going to see your tutorials. Mm -hmm. is smaller than the number of people who are going to read your lay science articles about your science. And so just thinking more broadly, I'm super excited because this talk is about writing papers, but I want everyone to remember that papers are a small part of our scientific writing job. Exactly. And, and there's many ways to get, you know, that is sort of the ultimate way to communicate appropriately and rigorously, but all these other ways are ways people get interested and bring them to your paper. And so just keep that in mind as we go. Great start, Kyle. Keep going. Sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, it's a good addition. I, I totally agree. Um, I, I, to, to that point, I, uh, I didn't really realize the power that Twitter had until a few years ago as well. Um, and, and I find a lot of really good, worthwhile, provocative, groundbreaking pieces of work over Twitter uh, by people tweeting them out. So, and tweeting them out in a way that's understood more generally and free of jargon, which I, I like. Um, so, so yeah, so scientific writing 
in my opinion, scientific writing is the art of telling a story. So I found this really, and this is a couple of years ago, I found this really interesting analogy uh, to, uh, it's called a story circle by Dan Harmon, who's one of the co-creators of Rick and Morty. He wrote this, uh, this blog post uh, and the link is uh, at the bottom of the screen. Um, where he outlines sort of the prototypical hero's journey. And this structure of the hero's journey has been, uh, has been around for, for millennia. It's, it's a tried and true method. It's used in, I think Dan Harmon says it's pretty much in every movie, every good movie, every good book. Um, and Really, I think scientific writing, writing a research article, can really be tra transposed onto the story circle. So there are eight components. So I'm just going to briefly outline the story circle on this slide, but then you'll find it like as a motif as we go forward. I'll have it like on I think each slide to show you where we're at in the story circle. So the introduction is you are in a zone of comfort. The field is in a zone of comfort. There's some base knowledge that the field has. But there's some gap in that knowledge. There's some hole. There's something that you as a researcher are trying to fill with your work. So the field, you want something. So that's two. So uh, you enter an unfamiliar situation, which is that the, the, the motivating questions and the uh, scientific hypotheses that are driving the research, that's driving that scientific piece of writing. Uh, number four is you adapt to it. So you, you create an experiment, you perform an experiment to address those questions. You, number five is you get what you wanted. So th these are your results. Uh, and coming with that is that sometimes you pay a heavy price. So it's hard to, oftentimes science is difficult. We have to interpret those results. And uh, those results might be, um, contra it might contradict the hypothesis that we have. So it's, it's, a, it's a tension between what we expect versus what we found sometimes. And that, sometimes that pays a heavy price to, for us. Um, number seven is we return to a familiar situation. So we, we take that new knowledge and we add that new knowledge to the body of knowledge that's already there. And we're trying to fill that gap. So number eight is hopefully the field has progressed forward. It has changed because of your research and that research article. So I'm going to go through the main uh, sections of present of the uh, of uh, publications. Um, so I'm going to start with the abstract, intro, materials, and message results and discussion. So an abstract. I found this quote online, which I think is a nice. It sums it up pretty nicely. It's a well prepared app. A well-prepared abstract enables readers to identify the basic content of a document quickly and accurately to determine its relevance to their interests and thus decide whether they need to read the document in its entirety. So in essence, an abstract is a miniature version of the paper itself. So it's gonna have all of those components of a paper. It's gonna have your question, it's gonna have your the, uh, the principal methods and principal results. It's going to have interpretations and implications for the field. And abstracts are incredibly important to get right because they're often the only thing a person will read of your paper. Um, they are essentially an advertisement for your paper. It's come read this. If, you, if this strikes your fancy, you come read it. They're really difficult to write because they're usually limited to 250 words. So in the abstract, you have to be concise. 
and you have to state only the essential facts without flowery language or anything like that. So what I do is I first, so I structure a manuscript around the figures. So I always create the figures first. I'm going to sort of like a scaffolding for the paper. And then I write the abstract. And I use that abstract as an outline for the rest of the paper. And then when I finish the paper, I get into a, good, a state that I want it in, and I might go back and revise the abstract accordingly if I've added stuff. Because one thing I've found is when you're writing, you often find connections between uh, your results you interpret in ways that you hadn't thought about like before you began the writing process. So you might discover interesting things along the way. So you'll have to go back and revise the abstract accordingly. Um, does anyone have any questions so far? I have a comment, which is that I completely endorse this method. The uh, creating the figures first and then the abstract. Yeah, f yeah, figures first, and then and then write the whole story briefly in the form of the abstract. And then I like your idea of of going back and revising, but it kind of give yourself a place to start. And the yeah. figures are the backbone, right? Yeah. They are your results and your story. And I love that you're linking the whole thing to a storytelling effort because it's the same. Yeah. Cool. So, so this is a. Uh, abstract from uh, Daniel Nichols' paper, 2019 Nature Con. Um, I think, how about we take just 30 seconds to read it? So I'm going to go through it, and I'm going to use this abstract as sort of um, as a model for how to structure a good abstract. Okay, so, okay, so I'm going to transpose this abstract onto the story circle, or attempt to do so at least, to show how I think it's a good abstract. So the first step of the circle is um, you're in a zone of comfort. It's the current state of the field. So the current state of the field up until 2019, so when this paper was published, it was that based upon uh, experimental evolution, we, we saw that um, collateral responses tend to be predictable. But the problems again, that communicate the value to the reader. So the, the problem is that the things that the reader cares about. So in a, in a way, the reader is kind of selfish. We're all, selfishness isn't a bad thing intrinsically. It, it could be bad, but it could be good too. Like we want to know, uh, we, we, we have uh, problems that we want resolve, we want solutions to in the field. And it's a very, it's a personal thing. Um, and the problem is the, uh, is the thing that communicates the value. And it's also the, no, uh, the, the step two is the knowledge gap. Um, so we want something. So the problem is it's pretty clear that, you know, uh, it, it's, it's relevant. This study is relevant to the problem of antibiotic resistance. It, through the results, it will uh, improve, hopefully improve upon this problem of antibiotic resistance and make it uh, less severe through uh, a better understanding of evolutionary mechanisms 
in trajectories that influence trade-offs between drugs. Because if we can use them to um, better create therapeutic options. So, so we're posing a problem and bioresistance resistance and um, the knowledge gap is um, that they might, the experimental evolution results prior to this might lead us to believe that collateral um, drugs might have an overstated therapeutic benefit. Because if one isn't considering contingency in the evolutionary process, one will tend to uh, to lean towards predictability rather un- rather than unpredictability in, in in resistance outcomes. So the third step is we enter an unfamiliar situation. So we define a knowledge gap and we attempt to fill that gap. So what is a motivating question? So in this case, Nicole et al. Uh, wanted to quantify the likelihood of the phenomenon that collateral responses would be unpredictable. We adapt to it. So what methods did we use to address our question? So they use a mathematical model parameterized with combinatorial complete fitness landscapes for Escher coli, and they use experimental evolution. They also perform targeted and whole genome sequencing. And then step five is we get what we wanted. So what are our results? So they verified that a second drug can indeed stochastically exhibit either increased susceptibility or increased resistance when following the first. Genetic divergence is confirmed as a driver of this differential response. So those are the results. And then uh, I lump six, seven, and eight together, um, but we have to interpret those results. So the heavy price we pay, again, is that sometimes we don't find what we expect. Interpretation is difficult, et cetera. So how do your results fit in the context of the knowledge gap you defined? Hopefully the field has improved because of your work. So in the abstract, they say, these results highlight that the success of evolutionary informed therapies is predicated on a rigorous probabilistic understanding of the contingencies that arise during the evolution of drug resistance. You pose a problem and the, uh, the, the research addressed that problem. And it's all in the abstract. So I want to highlight that the reader gleans all the information that they need to know from the abstract. And then if the you wrote the abstract well, and if the audience has some uh, pre-existing interest in reading the paper, then you know an economist isn't going to come across this paper and is likely to read it. Um, but the audience you intend it for, if reading this abstract, this good abstract, they'll they'll tend to read it. So it's a it's a it's an advertisement. So it needs all of those components. And then the story circle model is followed throughout the manuscript. So um, actually, I should stop. Does anyone have any questions so far? So who's Rick and who's Morty in this story? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I th- I, you're a pretty good Rick, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in the introduction, the job of that section is to supply sufficient background information to allow the reader to understand and evaluate your results without needing to reference other publications on the topic. 
I think most importantly, the introduction needs to provide a clear rationale for the study. So this is where the value comes into the reader. So it needs to address uh, how your present study challenges that reader or the field. It needs to address a problem that the reader in what field has and how your research addresses it. And those code words I mentioned before, so if they come up in the introduction. And they, again, they indicate value to the reader. They indicate, usually they indicate instability attention. Um, so the instability attention is there's the field, but the field, the knowledge, well, the knowledge in the field is incomplete. And you're, there's a problem and or there's a cost to the reader. And your uh, paper is providing a benefit to the reader. It's alleviating that cost and it's providing a benefit to the field. And those code words include uh, like, however, but inconsistent, although unknown, unexplored. There's a many uh, different code words. And um, the, uh, the, the, the person I mentioned before, the, the person that um, uh, uh, gave that lecture, uh, Rick Enemy, he says that it's probably a good idea to um, take 15 minutes or a half hour out of your week um, on a consistent basis, read a paper and just look for those keywords that communicate instability. Um, and you write those down because then you become more aware of them, of course. But then if when you're going to write your own research uh, article, you have a word bank that you can just pull from when you need to. Um, the introduction also needs to briefly summarize um, the methods that we use in the investigation and the principal results and conclusions. And don't bury the lead. So state your principal uh, uh, results and conclusions at the end of your introduction. Don't keep the uh, reader hanging. Don't, don't hold back. Um, be upfront about what those results and conclusions are. So, um, the the uh, so if we if we read this um, excerpt here um, from Lindsay at all twenty thirteen, um, we get, we get a whole bunch of background, and then we get our value statement. We get the code word, however, and then we get how this is this work is addressing a gap in knowledge. So we get like a whole bunch of background on the fact that um, um, a, 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 a really uh, old evolution experiment that um, increased the, the temperature um, gradually for, uh, what was it? Um, I think it was, I think they were, I forgot what the organism was, but he was, he was increasing the temperature gradually and the organism slowly adapted to increasing temperatures. But when they, he took the, the ancestor and put it into the, the temperature that the evolved population evolved to, it immediately died. So it was showing that adaptation occurs over time. Um, and they say, however, the precise genetic underpinnings of these evolutionary dynamics have remained unexplored. So up until now, up until 2013, primarily these studies have been working phenotypically at adaptation and not at the genetic underpinnings. So this is the value statement that this uh, paper is getting across. So then we jump to the materials and methods. 
So give full details of the methods you use to perform the study such that another competent researcher can reproduce it. So the materials and methods section, you'll want to, um, if needed, detail and defend the experimental design that you chose. And um, you also ought to, if, if the statistics in your paper are complicated or complex or non-standard, I would provide details about those methods. Um, also, I think importantly, one should always include um, a citation to their data and their code, um, whether that's on GitHub or another repository uh, in the materials and, materials and methods section. Um, I think that uh, research should be reproducible by anyone and um, inclusion of that uh, I think um, really improve science as a whole. If, if everyone got in the habit of sharing data and their analysis code freely and openly without restrictions. Um, so the materials provide the exact technical specifications and the quantities used. Um, the organization of the materials and methods needs to follow the order in which you present the results. So if you, let's say you, in the result section, you present phenotypic data first and then genotypic data second. In the materials and methods, you need to state how you obtain those phenotypic data first and then the genotypic data. So there should be... Um, uh, there should be a particular order of your paper and you should follow it across the different sections. Um, you should use past tense. Like we, we, we centrifugated uh, cells, we extracted DNA, so it's all past tense. Um, but so this is sort of like a personal preference. Uh, um, I, I like to use both active and passive voice in my materials and methods. I find, like for example, just using active voice it sounds really stilted, saying like, we did this, we did that. Um, but pa passive voice to me, it also sounds a little stilted. Um, so I like to mix them up. And, uh, and, and, and yeah, just use both of them. But again, that's sort of like a personal preference. Oh yeah, so like passive would be like overnight cultures were harvested by centrifugation and genomic DNA was extracted. Whereas, pa whereas active would be we harvested overnight cultures by centrifugation and extracted genomic DNA. I, so as a general rule, I think one should write their papers in active voice when possible. Um, but the materials and methods are one of the sections that you can you can use passive. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I would agree too. There, Kyle. I, I like that you're talking about this in particular. I, I think it is. I think we learn in school that it should all be passive in materials and methods. But I think some of the best papers I've ever read maintain a, a rigorous yet active voice throughout materials and methods. Um, it's, it's hard to do, but uh -huh. I think it's, I think like you said, a, a mix is, is reasonable. Yeah. It's just, it's just more fun to read. It is. It's more fun to write and read. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think you want people to read and therefore if it's fun, there's a better chance. I also think that it, if there's ever a chance of people skipping part of your paper, mm -hmm. it's this section. Yeah. And, and and also it might be skipped while they're reading it. I mean, there's even some journals now that put these at the end, right? And they just say, write your story. And then if people want to know how you did it, they can go back to this section. Yeah. Um, but it's sort of, that's just journal dependent. Well, even like, um, like nature and science, they'll just put it online now. 
question uh, page limit restrictions mm-hmm. and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so I noticed I have a, a wayward, uh, I have an orphan bullet point down there. <laughs> um, anyhow. Uh, so the results section, um, it, it reports a new knowledge you are contributing to the field and it pertains, and pertains to the motivating questions. So the result section, um, uh, uh, for each subsection, it gives a, a brief background, a uh, description of the experiment to orient and contextualize the results. So um, I, I tend to do this. Um, I think just reporting results without giving you any context behind them is confusing. So I'll, it depends on the result, but maybe at minimum one sentence to a few sentences, uh, just to just to orient the reader. Um, oh yeah, so I gave an example. It's about my recent paper. Um, so I just talk about how like resistance can arise and it can arise through different mutations and different uh, cellular pathways. I use that as sort of like a a military background to introduce the results that we looked at genetic parallelism uh, at the functional level. So we looked at parallelism within those pathways, like gene regulation and uh, metabolism and biosynthesis, et cetera. So I think it it helps the reader. I don't know if you'll mention it, but there's some journals, and, and I often adopt this, that in, in addition to kind of baby titling the section like you've done, like the sort of small, if it was in LaTeX, you'd use slash paragraph rather than slash sub subsection or something. Mm-hmm. But um, there's also folks in, in, some, in some styles, I think it's very nice to sort of state and i think cell does this pretty well as a matter of fact not that i'm advertising that once you publish in cell mind you but um they require the first sentence of a result section to be the result mm-hmm. in very sort of succinct maybe not even super scientific terms but like instead of saying genomic parallelism at functional level you'd say genomic parallelism is exhibited at the functional level in this context period and then the paragraph describes this. So rather than saying what the paragraph will be about, you say the paragraph. And so I think something you said really nice earlier, Kyle, was, um, you know, the abstract might be the only part they read. What I really like about some papers is that you can sort of read the abstract and then run through the bullets of the results. You could read the entire results section if you're in a hurry in four sentences. It's almost like a mini distillation of your results. Um, and it also helps you focus your storytelling because you can really say, this is my first result, this is my second result, this is my third result, kind yeah. of in a bullet point format. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I include later on uh, in like the last slide, I'd say one should use topic sentences. I think that gets to your point. The first sentence yeah. of the paragraph should state the main idea that you're going to convey. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you could do that either in a header kind of a way or literally state the result. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then to add to that, uh, yes, the, the, uh, um, the apps. So like sometimes I read the abstract and then I just look at the figures of the results and those two things to, to glean enough of the paper without reading it in its entirety. If I don't have the time or if it's not 100% relevant to me, um, I think the abstract and the figures of paper can, uh, to, to, a, to an audience who is short on time <laughs> uh, can convey a lot. And I think those are the most important. I, I say that the, the, the abstract um, is an advertisement, but I think I should amend that to say the abstract and the figures are the, the advertisement. Um, but anyhow, 
So um, in the results, you should reserve the interpretations for the discussion section. You should, in the results, you should present the data in a logical, clear, and concise manner. You should, you should present representative data, not all data. So don't do like a data dump and um, don't, uh, don't think that if you wrote it in your lab notebook, it's, you should put it in the paper. You should condense those uh, those data into meaningful things and present those things um, because you, it's, you can often get overwhelmed reading the results section otherwise. Um, you should avoid redundancy and reporting data between the texts and tables and figures. So. If you show data in a table, a figure, but I don't know, if you show like a p-value, I tend to, if I show p-value in a table or figure, I tend not to show it in the main text just because it's redundant. Um, I would say a good rule of thumb is try to um, limit redundancy whenever possible in a manuscript. Now, some things like, of course, you want to, uh, not be redundant, but uh, in in some things, repetition is good. So, like you need, you want to, you want to repeat your um, again. You want to repeat your principal results in pretty much every section except for the materials and methods. You want to repeat them in the abstract, introduction, results, and discussion. So, it's not a strict rule of thumb, but like. It's a good rule. I guess it's a good rule with them. I don't know what I'm trying to say. You shouldn't follow it strictly, but it's a good thing to follow nonetheless. I also think that there's a difference between redundancy and repetition. I mean, you know, it, I guess I guess the denotation of both words in a dictionary would be like quite similar. But you know, and like any good joke, you want to repeat it a few times during the course of your stand-up, <laughs> right? You kind of get more and more laughs. As you give the same joke over and over again, and so so the same goes for I think your main result, right? I think you want to tease someone with it at the beginning, show them why they care about it in the middle, and hammer it home at the end. And so that's repetition. But I think there's a there's a difference from where you want to truly avoid redundancy, which is sort of showing the same stuff over and over. Right. Um, it's different than well, th th there's there's subtle differences, and they're sort of hard to describe. But I think you're you're saying the right thing. Yeah, it is kind of hard to describe, but yeah, it's a good, I think that's a good analogy. <laughs> the stand up comedic analogy. <laughs> so, um, in the tables, of course, they go in the results section. Um, so, if you need to present only a few pieces of data, I do so in the text rather than making a whole separate table for it. Like it doesn't make any sense to make a table for like you know like one if you if you just giving like one p value or something. Um, the footnote for a table should provide enough detail such that the meaning of the data can be understood without referring to the text. Uh, you want to use descriptive wording such that the reader does not have to refer to that. So, for example, use uh, drug-treated cells or non-drug-treated cells instead of group one or group two. I think it's pretty straightforward stuff. And the figures. Um, so so if I, I want to give some things that I tend to do. So I, I prefer to include schematic illustrations. I usually put them as a figure one, or if not, if there's a figure limitation for the journal, I'll put it in the supplementary information, but include it nonetheless. And I think there's several good reasons for it. It highlights the predictions and the possible results drawn from each of your hypotheses. So it shows the reader that you're thinking about the outcome of the experiment and how your um, how those outcomes are, sorry, how those predictions are drawn from the hypotheses. So it's just a good scientific method. Um, it can highlight the study design. 
Um, so if you have a complicated study design, it's it's good to put that in the I think a, a picture. Um, they serve to orient the reader and give context to the work. And they are important components of grant proposal. So I remember sitting down and networking once with Ben Kerr. And uh, this was at a Beacon Congress a few years back. And we asked him, what do um, uh, grant committees, uh, study sections, what do they want to see in a proposal. And the first thing he said was they want to see schematic illustrations. Uh, yes, I was just calling to see what scheduling and signing. Someone needs to mute. So yeah, he said that the most important thing that the um, study section wants to see, the, the committee, whoever is reviewing that grant, is that they want um, a schematic illustration of hypothetical results. Um, again, because it shows that you are thinking ahead and um, it really sort of is part and parcel with the, this, this, uh, the scientific method. Um, so I, I think in three, sorry, two out of the three dissertation manuscripts I've written, I think I've had a schematic illustration showing hypothetical results. Um, oh no, I've had an all three. Yeah, I've had an all three. Um, so figures need to accurately represent the data and look professional. And I really recommend Klaus Vilke's uh, Fundamentals of Data Visualization. This is, you can, it's, a, it's a book that he wrote in our markdown, it's online. Um, you can also buy a, a printed version on Amazon, but uh, the link to this is on the bottom right-hand corner. But he goes through pretty much every type of graph that you might need. And he lays out the, the design principles for each of those graphs. Um, so figures need to be accompanied by a legend. And it's like a well-written legend lets the reader understand which figure without referring to the text. Again, there's this common theme. If you're going to make like a footnote or a legend, it should be descriptive enough that you don't have to refer to your text. I would reiterate that and say a figure should stand alone. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. This goes back to sort of what I was saying before. With, you can look at the abstract, you can look at the figures and get the gist of the research article without necessarily going through all of the sections in the unit. Um, the legend title describes what the figure is showing or a key result. So it's like, you should always have like a, the first sentence of that figure legend uh, stating those things. Um, you should avoid, again, you should avoid the repetition with the result section. And of course, you should explain figure features like the bar, symbols, colors, shades, um, just to help orient the reader. Hey, Kyle, if mm -hmm. uh, for next time, if you do this talk again next year or if someone else picks it up, I think a really nice slide here would be to find a really good figure and a really bad figure. Mm -hmm. You know, so maybe a figure that's both difficult to interpret with a poor legend and then a nice, clean, simple one with a, a legend that really does what you're saying. Yeah, that would be a good addition for next time. <laughs> so last section, there's a discussion. Um, so the first paragraph of, just, of the discussion should briefly summarize the motivating questions, the general methods, and the principal results. So it's often said that, well, in the introduction, you're going from broad to narrow. In the discussion, you're going from narrow to broad. 
So you present with principles, relationships, and interpretations in light of the questions and the results. So the discussion is where you interpret any incongruencies between results and hypotheses. And it's also important to state your limitations explicitly of the, of the study. So I really like Richard Feynman's essay called Cargo Cult Science. Um, and it talks about um, the, it, there's a, it talk, the main sort of theme of this is that um, essentially we need as scientists, when you get to be very open and upfront, transparent about not only what we found, but any, anything that could cast doubt on our results. Um, and it's, it's being completely honest and ethical as scientists. And I really like this quote that encapsulates that sentiment. If you're doing an experiment, you should report everything that you think might make it invalid, not only what you think is right about it, other causes that could possibly explain the results. So it really goes to the scientific integrity. And the discussion is where you want to be, you want that integrity to shine. So you want to write about how your results agree or disagree with previous research. The implications of your study. And it's also helpful to highlight any further unanswered questions and future directions that can address those questions. And because you have to do all of this, it's often the harder section, at least for me, to write. Um, so this is what the section I spend the most time on. So just to wrap things up, there's some random other tidbits I wanted to note. So to become a better writer, one needs to practice and read the literature often. And it's also very helpful to do manuscript review because you then, as now a reader reviewing a manuscript, you start to see things like, oh yeah, you start to see those like motifs, those things that you, you would like to, that you need to understand the, the writing that you have in front of you, and then you start to incorporate those into your own work. Uh, the principal results should be stated again in the abstract intro results and discussion section. So this is going back to, um, repetition that we talked about. Uh, and then this is, uh, uh, I brought this up briefly before, but you want to use topic sentences. Again, it's the first sentence of a paragraph and they express the main idea and they help organize and structure the manuscript. So I just gave an example of a topic sentence. Um, so we observed rapid increases in settling rate over the course of selection, and they go and describe the results pertaining to that. So this is sort of like a, this is really random, but it's something that I learned as a graduate student that I think really helps, um, uh, 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 what's the word? Um, it really helps with clarification. Um, so it's avoid hitting this, that, these at the start of sentences. So fill in the words you actually mean. So this result suggests rather than this suggests. It's just being more explicit with what you mean. And I think that's never a bad thing when it comes to writing. But this is one of my, I add this because it's a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> um, so I see it all the time. Um, and then lastly, it's better to simply describe a finding than to say that such and such a study has shown that. So for example, let me move all the spaces out of the way. Um, so for example, uh, 
This came out of a proposal I wrote. A recent study found that trade-offs that cause evolving resistance to one antibiotic to create a cost of increased susceptibility to another can depend upon the path that evolution initially takes. So you can take out, so this was in an earlier draft of the proposal. I took a recent study found that, I took that out. Made it more concise by saying trade-offs that cause evolving resistance to one antibiotic to create a cost, et cetera, et cetera. So it just, it makes things more concise and easier on the reader, I think, um, to, to, to just state what the principal result was of the study without necessarily saying the study showed that where uh, Nickel at all found that, you know. Um, but anyhow, so that is, that's it.